The next item of business is a, deba a debate on motion 6126 in the name of Edward Mountain on freedom of information requests. Can I invite members who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons, please? And I call on Edward Mountain to speak to and move the motion up to eight minutes, please. Pre Presiding officer, I'm delighted to bring this motion to the chamber on the issue of freedom of information and would at the outset like to move the motion in my name. Now, I started campaigning to become an MSP in 2010. And one of the reasons I did so was because I felt like many others probably across this chamber and across Scotland, that politicians seemed remote, unapproachable and secretive. Countering these traits remains one of my key drivers and that is what this debate is all about. On Tuesday the 13th of June this year, there was a members debate on the freedom of information. And on the lead up to that debate, I did some research on the topic which I was speaking on, and I was shocked. When it came to speaking in that debate, I found I was sharing a platform with Neil Finlay, Andy Whiteman, both of whom I probably shared little political ground with. But it was clear that during the, as the day, debate progressed, that we share a lot in common on the transparency of government. The critical freedom of information laws and the procedures in Scotland are based on the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002 and the Environmental Information Scotland Regulations 2004, both introduced to improve government transparency with the, with the aim of setting strong standards. But what we've heard from journalists across the political spectrum is that they have serious concerns about the way in which the Scottish Government is interpreting and implementing that legislation. Now, I don't always believe what I, I see that journalists write, but in this case, there is no smoke without fire. We have heard from them about their concerns regarding the freedom of information requests, and some of the issues they raise include delays beyond the 20-day working deadline, emails requesting updates being routinely ignored, officials delaying responses for so long that initial requests are answered only under internal review, and Scottish Government officials taking control of requests from other government agencies without the consent of the applicant. I could go on. It, I will take an intervention. Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank, thank the member for taking an intervention. I wonder if the member would like to comment on the article on the BBC's website earlier this week, which is titled FY Failings at the Heart of Government. The report about the UK government talks, talks about delays as being unacceptable, extremely unhelpful, extremely protracted, considerable, notable, unreasonable, unsatisfactory, excessive, prolonged and severe. We've accepted in the Scottish Government that we intend to improve our response, our, our, our performance. I see no line from the UK Government accepting that they need to improve their response. Ah. Edward Mountain. Do you know, I, I love taking interventions on subjects such as this. It reminds me of when I was about eight years old and I was in the playground and I got criticised for doing something wrong. And I ran to the teacher and said, it wasn't me, miss, it was them. <laughs> now, this government needs to stop doing that and needs to take responsibility yeah, yeah. and deal with the issues that they're dealing with. I will continue. In their open letter, the journalists explained that their experience raised concerns whether they were being treated and managed differently when it came to freedom of information. Now, we all know as members in this parliament, when we raise tricky questions, they're met often with smokescreen, mirrors and diffusion. Indeed, many find the temptation, and I have, to make freedom of information requests so wide-ranging that there's no way that the answers can be dissembled. But let's be honest, delays in withholding information are not acceptable, and it is no surprise that former Scottish Information Committer, Commissioner Rosemary Agnew ordered ministers to improve their performance. A position when it comes to freedom of information that I know Richard Lockhead agrees with, and I'm glad to see him in the chamber here. He is reported as saying, dithering and delays are unacceptable, as they are for months and months that it takes governments to respond to freedoms of information. Now, he made that comment about the UK government, and I make the comment that does thing. So, during this debate, I'm sure we will hear many examples of how this SNP-led Scottish Government avoids scrutiny. Meetings with no agendas and certainly no minutes, hiding behind thin veils of commercial confidentiality. To me, that points to a code of secrecy, defending the indefensible 
and fueling the lack of trust that the public have in politicians. Now, only a week ago, we heard rebuttal of these allegations from the government. The Minister for Parliamentary Business provided a long list of statistics. In fact, Joe Fitzpatrick, in his long and disjointed speech that even he wasn't allowed time to finish, made some assertions which, according to my research, paints only half the picture. Assertion one, the number of freedom of information requests have spiked. Assertion two, this government achieved consistently better levels of response than the 61% that was achieved under the last full year of the previous administration. Assertion three, the Scottish government was better than the UK government. Here, there it goes again. Well, here, let me answer those. There have been more freedom of information, but this Scottish government in 2016-17 have only answered 38% of those in full, whereas in 2014-15, 46% were answered in full, a clear drop. And in 2016-17, 21% of those answers were late, 21% late. Um, I'm, I'm short of time unless I'm... I can give you half a minute extra. Thank you. Yes. Neil Finlay. I think there is a correlation between garbage parliamentary answers and the spike in FOIs. Edward Mountain. Um, yes. <laughs> now, what is clear, as I was saying, is that this government is truly good at is spin. And they're not good to listening and telling the whole story. And that government, in response to this motion, made it clear they accepted the criticism being raised against them, but would try and mask their failings by announcing that they would go further by publishing all responses to FOIs online. This debate, presiding officer, to me proves that we, the Conservatives, are doing what we promised to do when we were elected. Yep. We're holding this government to account. And by their own admission, by their own admission, the SNP agree that we need an independent inquiry and that we need post legislative scrutiny. And let me assure those that are listening to this debate, we will keep a very beady eye on this government to make sure that they change the way they deal with FOIs. Why? Well, because this government knows it's wrong and that they know they need to be more accountable. And let's be honest, in a mature and stable democracy, what they are doing is frankly indefensible. Disingenuous way, they know they're wrong and they can't hide it. We, this party, this parliament and the press will hold the government to account. And in future, they must be more honest, transparent and accountable. Now, I look forward to hearing the evidence from other speakers this afternoon. And I hope during the afternoon I might see some humility from this government. Could you move the motion, please, Mr Mountain? Sorry, I thought I'd moved it at the beginning, but I, I certainly... I don't think you did. I, I, I oh, everybody's nodding away. I shall check the official <laughs> report, but moving it twice is not a problem. I, I would never <laughs> disagree with the presiding officer, and I move this motion. Thank you very much. <laughs> I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move Amendment 6126.1. Thank you, presiding officer. In moving the amendment in my name, I'd like to thank Mr Mountain for giving us the opportunity to discuss how we might improve openness and transparency. But first, I want to address our performance. Twelve years on, the statutory right to request information from a public authority and to be given it has been embedded in our culture. People understand their rights and this has led to a steady increase in requests. FOI requests are also becoming more complex, with the average FOI response requiring seven hours, seven hours of staff time. Well, there might be some surprise that the government is accepting the motion. Anyone who's been listening to the debate will know that we accept our recent performance has not been good enough and we are working to improve it. It's a pity that the UK government, which actually has more civil service implications in Scotland than the Scottish government, don't accept that they need to improve their performance. But this work to improve our performance is being undertaken in tandem with assessments of our performance by the Office of the Information Commissioner, in effect an ongoing independent inquiry. The Information Commissioner is selected by a cross-party panel. It is independent of government and has always performed their performance without fear or favour. A new Commissioner will be appointed by Parliament next week and whoever is selected will no doubt want to continue that assessment to ensure we are taking the steps to uh, meet the standards which are expected of us. 
Of course. Neil Findlay. A week ago, the Minister claimed that he wanted to highlight the Government's achievements on transparency, claimed they operated to the highest standards and were involved in the best, best practice. Today, in the amended motion, he will vote uh, for that, and that condemns his government, and by dint of that, his own performance. Is this an outbreak of humility, or is it just a shambles? Well, Joe Fitzpatrick. If, 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 if Mr Finlay had bothered to listen to anything I said last week, then he would have heard me making that point last week. We are clear our performance is not what it should be, and I was clear our performance was not what it should be last week, and we are in the process of trying to improve that. Um, before I cover the actions that we are taking, um, to improve our performance, I want to address some of the concerns set out recently by members of the media and this chamber. We don't get everything right, and I recognise that people have at times had reasons to be unhappy with our past performance. Firstly, as, but firstly, as I've already said, we accept our performance is not where it should be, and we are working to improve it. Secondly, it is important to recognise that the vast majority of requests are answered on time. When a response is late, officials will send a holding reply, where possible giving the, an indication of when to expect a response. When that does not happen, it is clearly unacceptable, and that is one of the areas we are working to improve. It is not in the interests of the Scottish Government um, to block or refuse requests on tenuous reasons or to miss a deadline, as has been suggested. Information can only be withheld for valid reasons, and the ultimate arbiter of that test it is not the Scottish Government, it is the Scottish Information Commissioner whose decision is final. Public bodies handle their own individual requests. Any other practice would be a breach of the law. Yes. Tavish Scott. Very grateful to, to the Minister for giving way on the point of, the, uh, of responding to the concerns that were expressed in the journalist's letter uh, earlier this month. One of those, of course, is that requests are being screened for potential political damage by special advisers. Is that true? Joe uh, Fitzpatrick. No, no. Um, requests are all prepared by Scottish Government officials. Uh, special advisers have a role in uh, assessing draft responses for accuracy. <laughs> Presiding officer, as discussed in the chamber last week, I recognise the interests of the media in the operation of freedom of information legislation. As well as responding to the recent letter from members of the media, I will also be meeting with the National Union of Journalists to discuss these and other points and how we can use our improvement plans to build confidence in the FOI um, process. Turning now to the action we are taking, we clearly need to ensure we have appropriate resources in place to comply with our, our obligations. We are also taking steps to raise the profile of FOI through improved local management and staff training and we have set up an improvement project examining different approaches to case handling. We need to acknowledge, though, that the ever-increasing expectation is that information will be readily available without having to ask for it and at the click of a mouse. Proactive release is one way which we have chosen to feed that hunger for information. Current publications include ministerial engagements, travel and expenses, information uh, and detailed information on Scottish Government spending. And we continue to look for opportunities for proactive release. So in tandem with improving our FOI performance and as part of our continuing development of the Scottish Government website, I'm taking steps to ensure that all information released in response to information requests is also published online from the 3rd of July. Ensuring information is published when it is released ensures that it is available to all without further requests and adds to transparency. That information will be available on the publication section of the government's website at beta.gov.scot. This move making information more readily accessible is very much in line with the principles of open government. Our Open Government National Action Plan sets out several demanding commitments. These include increased financial transparency, empowering communities to influence budget priorities and increasing citizen participation in local government. It is, of course, important that our legislation remains fit for purpose and we have regularly revised our FOI framework to ensure it remains up to date. The 2013 Amendment Act improved the legislation by strengthening the ability to prosecute an offence under FOIA and paved the way for lifespan exemptions to be reduced from 30 to 15 years. We have also brought within scope numerous organisations delivering public services and members will no doubt be aware of our consultation on extending coverage to registered social landlords, which I expect to respond to in the autumn. 
On the point of scrutiny, very quickly, um, I, I, clearly it's not for government to tell committees what scrutiny they, they wish to do, but I think if any committee does decide it wants to have scrutiny in this area, then the Information Commissioner's outgoing report um, point, has some points which might be a good starting point for that. Presiding officer, um, in conclusion, this government believes in, in open government, and I, ask the, I move the amendment in my name and ask the Parliament to support it. I call on Alex Rowley. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today following the motion that was raised for debate last week by my colleague Neil Finlay, where he highlighted some of the many concerns surrounding the Freedom of Information Act and the performance of this SNP government. I would like to reiterate concerns raised in Mr Finlay's motion, namely that the application of the Freedom of Information Act by ministers and officials is questionable at best and at worst implies a culture and practice of secrecy and cover-up, including through routinely avoiding sharing information, often through not recording or taking minutes of meetings that are attended by ministers and senior civil servants. Speaking from experience, and I am sure many members across this chamber can agree, the responses to freedom of information requests from the Scottish Government have been relatively poor. As such, Labour supports the calls for an independent inquiry into the way the Government deals with freedom of information requests and the potential to undertake post-legislative scrutiny of the Freedom of Information Act. In the interests of open government, and in particular full transparency of government, I hope today that the government can recognise that they can do more when it comes to dealing with such requests under the Act. Now, the government amendment today, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, which accepts the motion recognising that the Scottish government has had poor performance in this area, is, in my view, welcome as is the commitment of the government to publish all material released under freedom of information. But I would say to Mr Fitzpatrick that he is stretching the imagination to then claim that this is a boost for open government. Personally, I think he misses the point and most fair-minded people will see through this for what it is. There are many issues that must be addressed before we can seriously claim any boost an open government. As Neil Finlay pointed out in this chamber last week, just two weeks ago, 23 prominent journalists signed an open letter to this parliament in which they raised very serious concerns about freedom of information requests and the way that they are being mishandled by this SNP government. In outlining the details of the complaints from the 23 journalists, Mr Finlay called for a proper investigation into the issues being raised, and that is why Labour will support the motion today. As well as looking at how freedom of information requests are dealt with, the inquiry presiding officer must also look at the level of information which is available. How can it be that government ministers are meeting with Quango chiefs, with business chiefs, with lobbyists, discussing issues that have major implications for the people of Scotland, and yet there is no record kept of such meetings? This is not right, and this Parliament must make clear that we expect to see openness and transparency in government. It has also been suggested that the Scottish Government officials and special advisers are delaying answers or simply rejecting questions. The whole point of the Freedom of Information Act should surely be to allow more openness and further transparency. It is not up to government ministers or officials or special advisers to decide what is in the government's interest to either disclose or not disclose. We also cannot ignore the fact that at times the responses to freedom of information requests seem more like they are dodging the questions than providing the answers. At its heart, freedom of information is about accountability. And this government must recognise that across this chamber and out with, there is a cry for further accountability, more openness and more transparency. 
By committing to an independent inquiry, the Government will show that it is committed to reviewing some of the damage it has done to the apparent open and transparent image it says it is committed to. Most importantly, presiding officer, there now needs to be change in the culture of how freedom of information requests are dealt with. The Government and this Parliament can show we want openness and transparency in all we do by supporting this motion today and indeed supporting the amendment from the SNP Government which acknowledges its weaknesses and commits to addressing them. We now move to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. Uh, Jamie Green to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today marks the third occasion in as many weeks that we're discovering, uh, dis discussing the, the government's issue with transparency. Uh, we bring this to the Chamber today, not just as opposition parties with our own concerns, but also those of the public, journalists and many third parties. Um, now, I am perhaps used to ministers here in this place engaging in the dark political art of avoiding to answer questions on important issues such as the Scottish economy, health waiting times, education standards, skills deficiencies, concerns over named person, Police Scotland, I could go on. In fact, anyone who sat here today during portfolio questions had to sit through a very painful 40 minutes of apologies, excuses and shoulda, coulda, wouldas from the front bench. The answer generally follows a pattern. It's usually deflection. And it usually involves the words Tories, UK government, or Westminster. In fact, we've heard UK government bingo played today already. Presiding officer, you can brush us off in this place, but people outside of this chamber have had enough. People have an absolute right to ask robust questions of their government, but not only that, get robust answers back. There is no anti-government conspiracy here today. Why? Because our criticisms are not in isolation. I was contacted yesterday by a constituent who regularly lodges FOIs to the Scottish Government across a wide range of topics, everything from asking about radiotherapy staff numbers to safety in sport. Now, he forwarded me the responses he's received, and frankly, they did not even remotely resemble an adequate response. We are having this conversation today because something has gone deeply wrong with the SNP's understanding of transparency. In today's Scotsman, they responded to my criticisms by saying, and I quote, Scotland has the most open and far-reaching freedom of information laws in the UK. Perhaps, but having far-reaching laws is not the same as adhering to those laws. It is simply no defense. They then go on to say, we take our responsibility for FOI seriously, and in the large majority of cases, we respond on time and in full. <clears throat> well, if that is the case, then why are over 20% of requests responded to late? That is more than double the naval national average. If that is the case, then why are requests from journalists being delayed beyond 20 days with absolutely no justification? And if that is the case, why are we finding out that in the example of the fourth replacement crossing, there is not a single minuted meeting between the minister in charge of that project and its main contractor in the crucial six months from October to March. Not a single minuted meeting. And if this is the case that you take FOI seriously, then why are Scottish ministers not sending full written updates to the Foreign Office after official overseas visits, as per the Scottish Ministerial Code? Uh, is that an intervention? I shall carry on. It was like, I perhaps I heard the word UK government or Westminster. I'm sure that was the excuse, as always. <laughs> Rosemary Agnew. Well, it's not just me saying that. It's Rosemary Agnew, the, uh, the Scottish Information uh, Officer previously, branded this government's performance simply as totally unacceptable. Those are the words she used. And earlier this month, we already know that journalists from across the political spectrum, not just from one area or another, they all signed a joint letter around this very issue. Delayed responses, poor responses, and in some cases, no response at all. What we're asking for today is nothing out of the ordinary. And the reason I want other parties in this place to back our motion today is not to make a political point, but to send a really important, clear message. The Scottish Government, its ministers, directorates, public bodies, and the whole civil service must be open to interrogation. But more importantly, the responses should be abundant, forthcoming, and accurate. 
But to be honest, having listened to the Minister of Spin today, I'm afraid we have a long way to go. Can I have Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Neil Finlay, please? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me start by very much welcoming the announcement uh, from the Government that takes public accessibility and the availability of information from FOI requests in uh, official hands to new heights. Now, I do want to talk about the Tories, uh, the party that have tabled today's motion. They've not always been the most enthusiastic of supporters of FOI. Stage one debate on the 17th of January 2002, Lord James Douglas Hamilton uh, described the FOI bill as a costly experiment to tinker with a culture of secrecy. And he went on, the executive seems to be intent on forcing through unnecessary measures. David McClatchy reinforced Tory antipathy to the very concept of an FOI bill by saying, if the bill has been shoved down the list of priorities, the people of Scotland, apart from a few political anoraks, will not shed many tears. And uh, I see Murdo Fraser here. He said, this bill does us no credit whatsoever. Now, my contribution to the debate on the 17th of January, uh, I said a desire to keep information is always an expression of someone's self-interest. I am strongly in favour of freedom of information. And to the extent, in fact, uh, that when officials in the Labour uh, Liberal uh, executive prepared guidance to uh, civil servants as to how to implement the bill, I was delighted as a result of an FOI to discover that they were quoting from my speeches in the guidance to implement it. In government and subsequently, I discovered that uh, the operation of the Act uh, places a proper burden on our public uh, servants, whether employed or elected. Uh, one of many ministers uh, in this administration and in previous ones, I found myself responding to a significant number of FOI requests. On many occasions, we found that I will, if it's brief, please. Joanne Lamont. It, it will be brief. Would you accept that people have been driven to go to FOI because of the very poor quality of written answers in this chamber with the resultant lack of transparency? If you get the written answers right, the burden on FOI wouldn't be quite so bad. Stuart Stevenson. No. And uh, I, I would say on many occasions we find the information, uh, while it's available, it's often dispersed around so many different areas that it can take a very substantial effort to, to retrieve it, organise it and present it. it. It was there for the benefit of the administrator, not necessarily for the inquirer. Um, I ceased to be a minister on the 6th of September 2012. That's nearly five years ago. Um, but for years after that, uh, I was still being asked to confirm the contents of responses to FOIs because they touched on my time as a minister. And of course, under the ministerial code, I'm not permitted to retain any ministerial papers. So it would be fair to say a number of the delays, mea culpa, are down to me as a backbencher, not always responding to civil servants who are looking for confirmation quickly enough. And I accept that. Um, it's not something, by the way, that is yet finished. I'm uh, summoned to appear in front of the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry. I'll have to come down for a full day to be briefed on what I did uh, between 10 and 7 years ago. So the reasons why there are delays are very diffuse. Um, Sir Humphrey Appleby and Yes Minister reminded us the Official Secrets Act is not there to protect secrets to officials. FOI is an important part of Civic Scotland's weaponry to ensure citizens can hold officials to account. You and I close. welcome the Tories' newly found support for FOI. Let's hope across all administrations in which they may be involved, they properly implement the principles and practices that are required. Can I say that um, later speakers' time will be cut if people don't stick to four minutes at the very latest. Neil Finlay followed by Andy Whiteman. Officer, there's many areas of government policy where the rhetoric fails to come anywhere near reality, none more so in the area of transparency. And this was self-evident to anyone who listened to the members' debate last week. They, there we saw normally obedient SNP backbenchers running for the hills rather than defend the government's appalling record on secrecy 
and evasion. And that members' debate came about after 23 experienced journalists representing media outlets with an editorial line that spans the po political spectrum wrote to this parliament to highlight the abuses and mishandling of freedom of information requests by the government. Joe Fitzpatrick. Intervention. I know the member's points. It sounds he's, he's going along the same lines as he was last week. Can I ask the member, does he accept that last week and again today, I've accepted that our performance is not good enough and I've explained some of the actions that we are taking to improve it? Neil Finlay. Uh, that was an unprecedented move by the journalists, highlighting requests being delayed, uh, emails asking for an update being uh, routinely ignored, the gaming of the system to stifle the internal review process, uh, officials taking control of requests to other agencies, requests being blocked for 10 years reasons, and requests being screened by special advisers, confirmed by the Minister today. All of these actions designed to block or limit the release of information. But here are more examples. In a month, the month between uh, September and October 2016, Keith Brown met with Ineos at Grangemouth. I asked for a copy of the ministerial briefing. It returned heavily redacted. Nicola Sturgeon attended Business for Scotland dinner. I requested notes, the guest list and any speech delivered by the First Minister. The Scottish Government said they had no information. Shirley Ann Somerville met Paul Little of Glasgow College. No minutes. Keith Brown meets the SME China Forum. No minutes. Keith Brown met Philippa Whitford, MP, to discuss Presswick Airport. Minutes heavily redacted. Keith Brown met Sir Hugh Aiken of the CBI. No minutes. Keith Brown met Global Scots. I asked for a copy of the minute or the note. No information available. Nicola Sturgeon met with Petro China to discuss Grangemouth. No minutes. The briefing redacted to the point it was meaningless. John Swinney met with uh, Sir Kevin Collins, head of the Education Endowment Fund. Exemptions were applied to the pre-minute briefing to prevent its disclosure, and then it was claimed it was an informal meeting and no minutes or notes were held. What a farce this is. These events involve just a few ministers over a very short period of time. And if you scale that up over several months or a year, it would show that these practices have been deployed on an industrial scale. Just three months later, the Minister for Parliamentary Business signed the Scottish Government Open Government Action Plan at an Open Government Conference in Paris. Mr Fitzpatrick, without the slightest hint of self-awareness, spoke at an event entitled Leave No Trace, How to Combat Off-the-Record Government. <laughs> I have FOI'd Mr Fitzpatrick's speech and I cannot wait to read it. Maybe they'll block it right enough. Here was the minister who is accountable to this parliament for the repeated failure to keep and release information. The minister who has seen 23 of our foremost journalists write an open letter of complaint about a very significant area that he has responsibility for lecturing other nations about open government. Now, today, at least today, in leaving the motion intact, he now condemns his own failings, humility not normally associated with this government. This is a minister who could not get a single backbencher to support or defend him last week. He stood there last week almost naked. Now the final fig leaf has fallen away. Yes, I have, you've left me stuck for words there, uh, Mr Finlay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have Andy Whiteman followed by Tavish Scott? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the debate last week certainly confirmed that the issues that have been raised by journalists are valid uh, and urgent. And as I'm sure all members agree, journalists and citizens need a robust FOI regime in order to hold power account, whether it be in relationship to matters such as recruitment in the NHS, conversations government ministers have with authoritarian regimes like China, and Donald Trump's status as a global Scot. Now, I'm particularly grateful that the Conservatives have brought this debate today as it provides me with an opportunity to remind members of what FOI can tell us about some of the Conservatives. Mr Henry Angest is a man I mentioned last week, Chairman and Chief Executive of our Buthnut Banking Group, former Master of the Worshipful Company of International Bankers, former Tory Party Treasurer and knighted for his efforts. Uh, he provided almost seven million to the Tory Party and was a funder of Atlantic Bridge, the charity that funded Adam Werity's excursions around the world with Liam Fox. Uh, he also provided substantial funds to the Tory party in Scotland and Murder Fraser will, I'm sure, know Mr Angest, who helped fund his doomed leadership bid for the Tory party. 
He also donated funds to Perth College for research, and we learned through FOI that he was angling for an honorary degree as a reward. But because Perth College retained copyright in this information release and refused to consent to me publishing this information, I am legally compromised in my ability to share this information with others. And that's one aspect of why FOI regime warrants a fresh look. Conservative members will also, I'm sure, welcome the EU's transparency regimes uh, on information held by the Scottish Government in relationship to the distribution of agricultural subsidies, uh, which allow us to know that a company called Peter Chapman & Co received £104,014 in farm payments in 2012, £114,800 in 2013, and £101,669 in 2015. And Delfer Farms, which the mover of this motion is a partner, £131,960 in 2015. Now, this is all very interesting, and I think it is relevant, and I think it's vital and useful information to allow citizens to understand how public money is being spent how public authorities are discharging their duties on our behalf and how much influence is exerted by private interest in public affairs. Turning to the motion, presiding officer, last week... Happy to do so. Neil Finlay. Given the information he's just disclosed to the Chamber, would Mr Whiteman uh, welcome a double jobbing bill being brought before this Parliament? I look forward Andy Whiteman. I look forward with interest to a double jobbing bill uh, and its contents, and I'll met, let the member know of my views on that when, uh, when it's brought. Um, last week, the Minister acknowledged uh, that we are not where we want to be. I think most members will concur with that view. And so I want to commend Ministers for not having sought to delete the motion and to have recognised the need to address failings in their own performance, as well as the need for post-legislative scrutiny uh, of the Act. I think this attitude, welcome attitude, sends an important single be signal beyond the politics here. This is not a party political matter. It's not even just something for the Scottish Government. It's something that's fundamental to democratic society. So I respect Scottish ministers for holding their hands up on this occasion, notwithstanding that substantial concerns uh, remain, some of which are highlighted by Alex Rowley. And I also want to commend ministers for their decision to publish full logs of information releases. This was a concern raised by Monica Lennon and myself last week, and the government's response is timely and welcome. But, presiding officer, in conclusion, I just want to raise two matters. Journalists raised many serious issues, none of which have been fundamentally addressed by the minister uh, today, in their letter. Now, I think the minister, in his opening remarks, confirmed that he'd be writing to journalists uh, to address those very specific concerns. Um, and uh, if you could confirm that in closing, that would be very welcome. Second, on the proposed disclosure log, there are some concerns about the release of sensitive information simultaneously to requesters such as journalists and to the public at the same time. And I would ask the ministers to reflect and whether they consider building perhaps a time lag of a day or two uh, to accommodate such cases. I merely make that as a suggestion. Thank you, presiding officer. Tavish Scott to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm with Andy Whiteman in recognising that Joe Fitzpatrick, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, has come here today to accept uh, the motion in Edward Mountain's name uh, and to uh, seek to amend it in a fairly mild uh, way rather than seeking to eradicate it. Although I have to say to Mr Whiteman that I think that's more because he knows he'd lose it were he to, to seek to eradicate the motion altogether rather than anything else. But what I want to concentrate very briefly uh, this afternoon is on the point in the motion that calls for an independent inquiry. Now, Mr Fitzpatrick is quite right. If that was for committees, that would be for um, the Parliament to decide uh, in the fullness of time. But what uh, this motion today is calling for is for an independent inquiry, and rightly so. It was the point that Neil Finlay made in last week's uh, members' debate that he initiated as well. Uh, and therefore, what I look to the Minister to do in his wind-up this afternoon is not only accept, as he does uh, implicitly, that need for an independent inquiry, but set out how that will now be put in place, because that's what now must happen. And as Andy Whiteman rightly said, the best place to start with that in independent inquiry would be the letter that the 23 journalists put their name to uh, earlier in this month. Who better to chair it than, say, Paul Hutchin or Tom Gordon? Uh, other suggestions can gratefully be received by the Minister, I am sure. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the, what I hope today is that, he will, that the Minister in his wind-up will set out that he accepts that inquiry, that there is a process now underway to initiate that inquiry, that it will be independent, and the chairperson, whoever that may be, will be very independent uh, indeed. Uh, there are two further points I want to make uh, this morning, this afternoon, because they illustrate what needs to be tackled by any review of freedom of information uh, that is taking place uh, at this time. Uh, the first is 
uh, a piece of work that James McEnany uh, is doing on the governance review that the government announced just the other day. Uh, last night, uh, he illustrated uh, on social media that he had submitted as a journalist questions to the government asking for uh, projected costs, additional funding or support, and some other information on additional support needs of the Scottish education system in the context of that governance review. Now, that is entirely fair for a journalist to submit those kind of questions, uh, and he did uh, that, and in addition asked a lot of other questions, just as uh, journalists are meant uh, to do to carry out their uh, job. What happened last night is the government, uh, instead of answering those questions, turned it into a freedom of information inquiry. Uh, that will delay it past the summer recess, or rather into the summer recess. Uh, there'll be no uh, answers to the questions he wants till then. But it begs the question, why did they turn it into um, a freedom of information request rather than just answer the questions. Now, there is a long email trail, there's a long Twitter exchange in all this, and in it, the journalist very clearly sets out uh, that he went back to the government official responsible, said, look, I will take half of this out, I will reduce the questions if they are too detailed. In other words, he bent over backwards as a journalist to recognise that some of the issues could not be answered quickly and would therefore uh, take some time. But, oh no, the Scottish Government put it all into freedom of information and then uh, made sure that it will not be answered for, for 20 days. Uh, at least. Now, no wonder some of us are a bit sceptical, a bit sceptical, presiding officer, about the way in which freedom of information is being handled in Scotland uh, today. And my other uh, illustration of that uh, is on the point the journalists made about, and I quote, Scottish government officials taking control of requests to other government agencies without the consent of the applicant. Uh, I have uh, a reply from uh, a former constituent of mine who is, who is an ex-fire officer who's been looking into maintenance queries across the Scottish Fire Service and in particular in the Highlands and Islands. And again, he was refused information uh, under freedom of information because of the cost argument but it turns out because he knows about this because he used to work for the fire service that the information available was all on a single database and one click of a button would have produced it so what is going on this needs to change and an independent inquiry is the way to make sure it does and i have richard lockhead to be followed by brian whittle there is a joke that you can tell how far our party is from government by how loudly it calls for robust freedom of information legislation. The point being, of course, that parties of all colours, when they get into government, like to keep certain things secret, and all parties, when they're in opposition, want maximum transparency and openness. And, of course, Tony Blair said in his memoirs in 2010, Freedom of information, three harmless words. I look at those words as I write them and feel like shaking my head till it drops off my shoulders. And he goes on to say, I used to say more than a little unfairly to any civil servant who would listen, where was Sir Humphrey when I needed him? We had legislated in the first throes of power. How could you, knowing what you know, have allowed us to do such a thing so utterly undermining of sensible government? Now, of course, that harks back to 97 uh, and the memoirs of 2010. This is 2017, and it is Scotland, not UK. And we should be relatively proud of how far we've travelled with devolution in this country in terms of openness, transparency, and involving citizens uh, in public life. And that is the hallmarks of a healthy democracy. And, of course, the outgoing Freedom of Information Commissioner, Rosemary Agnew, said herself in her farewell message, I believe we generally do well in Scotland. We are not perfect by any means, but we have a strong regime that enables access to a lot of information. The challenge for us all is how we develop FOI from such a strong starting point in a rapidly changing world. And she goes on to say again in her report that she issued shortly before departing office, that we can tell the respect we have in this country from what other countries are saying and the frequency with which we are approached to host or visit countries putting in place FOI for the first time and speak at both national and international events about FOI in Scotland. And she says, globally, we are seeing the contribution access to information approaches are having in supporting transparency, combating corruption, enabling citizens' participation and developing more democratic decision-making. And there are big issues out there at the moment, and that's why I do support having this debate today, such as privacy versus transparency, accuracy and truthfulness in a post-truth environment, trust and confidence, to use her words. Tavish Scott. Lockhead for giving way. He, he would also recognise that Mrs Agnew said, out, said in her uh, end-of-term report that, and I quote, public authorities now put greater emphasis on what not to disclose than on what ought to be released, didn't she? 
Richard Lockhead. Uh, and uh, it's debates like that that I said are welcome. Today's debate in Parliament of this very important issue for our democracy in this country. And, of course, she also pointed out, and reports in the media have pointed out, that 91% of Scottish public bodies published minutes of key meetings, agendas or strategic plans online, but only 54% provided all three. And these documents were, it said, hard to find in 38% of the websites that held them, and only 41% of public organisations put information on procurement and tendered contracts online. So there are challenges out there, and as a parliament, as a government, we have, of course, to address that, and that's why I warmly welcome the, the Minister's comments today. She goes on to say, we now know from the data collected since 2013 that FOI request volumes are increasingly year on year. This comes with an increasing cost that Scottish public authorities must meet if they're to be statutory compliant. And I should say that as a, someone who was Cabinet Secretary for nine years, I always took the attitude that we should put the maximum information into the public domain when we received FOI requests. I was also at the same time absolutely staggered by the amount of resources required within government to answer the FOI requests, the amount of time that key civil servants have to spend on answering those when, of course, there are other priorities government, as demanded by MSPs from across all the parties in this chamber, have to deal with. And there are real-life pressures the civil service and the Scottish Government face, and we have to face up to that reality. And I was pleased the FOI Information Commissioner uh, she recognised those pressures and she says the current system is unsustainable. We have to look at different ways of getting public informa or information now, into please. the public domain. So I do welcome this debate. I hope we can come back and have other debates about these new ways of getting information into the public domain to take pressure off must civil now, servants please. and look at other ways as well. I have Brian Whittle to be followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's an interesting debate to be speaking in today. Uh, one would think that legitimate scrutiny of government by parliament, the press and the general public would be an essential prerequisite in any open and transparent democracy. Nicola Sturgeon herself stated after taking office that she wanted, and I quote, an outward looking government which is more open and accessible to Scotland's people than ever before. However, from the evidence we've heard and are hearing today, these claims are a little bit wide of the mark. In the short time I have, I thought I would add my experience of asking FOIs and written questions of this government. And early on in this parliament, while speaking in a debate on one of the many Brexit Tuesdays eh, regarding farming, I had the temerity to suggest that we should take the opportunity to look at the Scottish market for Scottish produce. Fergus Ewing stood, puffed out his chest and boomed. Perhaps Mr Whittle should look at the Scottish Excel contract where the food that councils access is predominantly procured from Scotland. Suitably chastised, I decided to take Mr Ewan up on his suggestion. However, once in that loop of asking questions of the government, getting answers that avoid answering the question, despite it being very obvious what was being asked in the question, it began to feel very much like Groundhog Day. It's kind of like a war of attrition, finding a different way to ask the same question, trying to elicit a response that is remotely close to the subject of the question. After six months or so, it became very obvious why that question was being avoided and presumably why Mr Ewing in throwing out that challenge at me desperately, desperately hoped that I would not take him up on it because the public procurement XL contract does in fact not reflect the rosy picture painted by the Cabinet Secretary of locally procured highly, highly quality produce. However, after highlighting this oversight of the Cabinet Secretary, his colleague John Swinney instigated an investigation into the nutritional value of food in schools. Fantastic. So I took the opportunity to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Health to ask her if she would follow suit with an investigation into the quality of food being served in hospitals and would she commit to looking at procuring locally from farmers. The answer I got was that she was satisfied with the quality of food in her hospitals at the, and that the procuring local produce was subject to European procurement law. Now that answer obviously hopes that neither I nor my colleagues understand European procurement law, which I do, and therefore I know that that was a ridiculous answer. Secondly, and correct me if my geography is array here, Thailand is not in Europe, <laughs> nor is India or South America or New Zealand or the Far East, where a fair chunk of the food imports into the Excel contracts come from. You see, it's not just about avoidance of transparency and scrutiny that's the issue here. It's about also not taking the time to answer questions with a degree of respect becoming of a government. The most recent question I asked was regarding the value of public procurement of IT projects in the last 10 years and the percentage of that spend on Scottish companies. The very helpful answer I received from Derek Mackay, and I quote, that information is not held centrally. 
So the Finance Secretary apparently doesn't know how much public money is spent on the procurement of public IT projects and how much of that public money is invested in Scottish companies. Really, doesn't know or doesn't want to say. So let's go on that roundabout again and ask the same question in a different way. Presenting officer, this is not a game of hide the facts and say as little as possible. We are talking about the, the proper public scrutiny of our government. The members of this parliament are here at the bequest of the Scottish public and are therefore accountable to the Scottish public. If a question is asked of this Scottish government, it's a categorical right to expect that it will answer openly, honestly, warts and all, and ensure that the government can be held fully to account for the actions it takes on behalf of them, those whom this parliament serves. This is obviously not the current situation, and therefore the status quo cannot remain. The last of the open debate speakers is Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, open by declaring an interest as being a member of the National Union of Journalists? Uh, Presiding Officer, I was here last week um, listening to the members' debate, and I'm actually quite disappointed that the Tories have cho chosen to use this precious time in the Chamber to reiterate <laughs> some of the arguments that were given and answered last week by the government. Indeed, um, this is a, a week in which um, we're, we're in the Brexit negotiations with absolutely no openness or transparency from the Westminster government about how that's going to go. It's a week where they have elevated someone rejected by the voters to the position in the House of Lords in order that they can take up a ministerial position in the Scottish office. And I fail to see where the openness and transparency and democracy is at the heart of these decisions at all. Can we put this in context? The Scottish Government in 2016 was um, designated as a global leaving light in the campaign for open and accessible government as one of the pioneer members of the Open Government Partnership's inaugural international substantial government, uh, government programme. This government has the most advanced free of information laws in the UK. And it, the Information Commissioner herself has said, since Scotland introduced the Freedom of Information Scotland Act in 2002, it has put itself ahead of the international field. And that is the context in which we discuss these issues. Now, last week, I heard the government admit that they are not performing as well as they could be. I also heard the government commit to working with those who had raised concerns, including the journalists. Indeed, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary said he had written to Paul Holloran at the National Union of Journalists, offering to work with them and other journalists about their concerns in this area. The Scottish Government is already working with the Information Commissioner to improve this issue. And I hear the, quiet, the, the calls for an inquiry here. Let's, let's be absolutely clear, this is a legal matter. The Commissioner has a very powerful job and could have taken legal action against the Government, but has chose not to do so because the Government is working to improve the situation with the Information Commissioner, and I'm sure they'll continue to do with the new Information Commissioner on appointment. So the government have conceded things could be better. They are working to improve it. And I fail to see why the other members in this chamber cannot recognise those commitments from the government. An outgoing commissioner herself put into the public domain a hard document, proactive publication, a time for rethink, and which examines where we are in terms of freedom of information in the UK. And one, so one of the things she says, it's doubtful that FOI in its current form is sustainable. We now know from the data collected since 2013 that request volumes are increasing year on year. This comes with increasing cost that Scottish public authorities must meet if they're, they're able to, to be um, statutory compliant. And proactive publication is important, but not um, uh, will deliver in itself change. But proactive publication championed by this government, something they are working to do to ensure that freedom of information requests are no longer required because the information is in the public domain, is certainly changing the way things are happening and will move things forward. So can I say today, um, presiding officer, while I welcome the opportunity for, at all times to debate these issues, I do think that today has been a fig leaf on the the only fig leaf in the chamber has been on the part of the Tories who want to deflect from the utter shambles that is happening in Westminster at this time.
We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Derek Mackay. Well, I, for one, are quite happy to use the precious time of this Scottish Parliament to discuss something which is fundamental, not just to journalists, but to ordinary people who want to challenge secrecy and power in this society. I'm sorry. Claire Adamson has made many excellent speeches in this chamber, but I have to say, Claire, that is not one of them. If you do not recognise that people want their politicians, albeit in opposition, to challenge the government of the day on their failings, then I think that is quite sad. So rightly so, the government have accepted a rap over the knuckles for their poor performance, and we've got to give them some credit for that. But I hope, in accepting that, that the minister will accept that it is more simply than poor performance, because it is about the handling of the Freedom of Information Act. It is a charge of failing to operate it in transparency, withholding information unnecessarily. So I hope the government accept that it is a much wider and more serious charge than simply poor performance. I'd like to put on record, in fact, I thought Davish would, but Jim Wallace was the champion of this act to his credit and the coalition government introduced it. The right to know legislation allowing any citizen to simply ask for information held by the government. And it came about because of a growing dissatisfaction with secrecy surrounding government, policy development and decision making. It is an integral part of the human rights legislation and is recognised by Article 59 of the UN Charter. Indeed, I don't think there's never been an important time to embrace the idea, notwithstanding some of the excellent points made by Richard Lockhead, that maximum possible public disclosure of information by public bodies is, I think, the principle that we should all be striving for. The Westminster scandal of 2010, which was itself the centre of very early FOI requests, led to the lowest figures of public confidence in politicians. And so we all have a responsibility to open up government. But who do we compare ourselves to? Now, I heard Joe Fitzpatrick use in defence of an intervention by my, my uh, colleague, Neil Findlay. You know, I don't really want to compare ourselves to what's happening in the rest of the UK. I'd really rather compare Scotland's legislation to the other 100 countries who have excellent freedom of information. But in a sense, it doesn't really matter if it, and it was better at the time. What matters? It's not worth the paper it's written on if the government of the day sets out to undermine it by delay. <laughs> Lobbying governments. I mean, it's kind of like, it's slightly fundamental to the Labour Party. The, Labour, the, the lobby industry is a multi-million pound industry. Powerful people sit with ministers and they have the ear of those ministers. And I'm not condemning that. But because of that, the issues that colleagues around the chamber talk about where journalists have tried to get to the bottom. Now, I don't expect every uh, meeting uh, to be minuted in absolute detail. But I do expect there to be a minute available, certainly where there's any lobby organisation which has money and power behind it. I close, presiding officer, by asking the Cabinet Secretary if you could just clarify that you're supporting the, yes, supporting the, uh, the substantive motion tonight. Does that mean, therefore, that the government are supporting the independent review of the Freedom of Information Act? Thank you. My apologies for earlier confusion. It's Joe Fitzpatrick that I call now. Thank you. Up to five minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm not sure what to make of the reaction from the Chamber to the picture that Neil Finlay painted of me standing naked in the Chamber. I'll, I'll, I'll try and work that out later. <laughs> but in my opening comments, I acknowledge that FY performance of the Scottish Government is not good enough, and I outlined measures that we are taking to improve our performance and I think it was wider than just timeliness if, if you actually read what I was saying. We, we genuinely believe in freedom of information and we, we want to improve that and we want to improve the experiences which is why I'm meeting with the NUGA to try and understand 
um, what their concerns are and how we, we can improve. I, I really believe that our, I've got a lot to cover, I'm sorry. I believe that our proposals to publish FY responses along with information made available in response to FY requests is a significant step forward and demonstrates this government's commitment to openness. Um, a number of points were made by, there was a, a, few, a few, I thought, very helpful speeches in the chamber and I want to particularly put, um, respond to the ones which I thought were made from people who were not just here to have a go at the government. So I'm, I, I'm going to try and respond to some of the points in the, in, in the debate, so thank you very much. Tavish Scott, Tavish Scott made a, a particular point about um, a request um, being turned into a formal request, and that's because the legislation requires us to treat any written request for information as an FOI request. We have um, no option in that, but I, I think that is maybe the sort of thing that I can discuss with the, the NUJ to, just to try and understand how we get that, because I can, I can, I can understand the, um, the exaggeration um, of the Excuse me a moment, Mr there. Fitzpatrick, could you make sure you speak to the microphone? Sorry, Thank sorry. you. Um, I, I'm going to try and respond to the points in that Mr um, Finlay ignored my intervention entirely so I think I'm, I'm going to try and focus on the points of people who made uh, remarks in the chamber. Um, Mr Scott also um, talked about um, the concern which was in the, in the letter of the Scottish Government um, taking over requests to other bodies and, and the, the fact as I said in my speech that is, is just not the fact it would be against the law to do that. Um, public bodies handle their own requests. I think perhaps to understand it is that the Scottish Government and its agencies, which does not incidentally include the fire service, um, are regarded as one um, authority, one public authority for the purpose of FOISA. And so that might be where there's some um, misunderstanding there um, on, on that point. Uh, Tavis Scott and Andy Whiteman, um, I think I'm going to, as I said, continue to try and get through some of the, the points, the substantive points that, that people make. Tavis Scott, um, Alex Rowley and Andy Whiteman all talked, I think, about independent inquiry. Um, the Information Commissioner, as Claire Addison said, is the legally obliged person to, who's in, in charge of FOI. They have a, a, a very uh, important role. They are independently appointed um, by this parliament. Um, and it is their role. They have started that process of looking at our processes to make sure we get it right. And I'm sure that will continue with the, the new information commissioner. And I, I'm certainly happy to engage with the new commissioner once they are appointed to discuss um, what further should be done in terms of making, that, um, uh, uh, making our, our FOI um, regime more transparent. Andy Whiteman um, talked today and about the the, his comments last week and Monica Lennon's also about the, 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 the data logs um, and um, contrary to some of the, um, the theories which have been conspiracy theories which have been roaming around Twitter it was very much in response to the points that, that Monica Lennon and Andy Whiteman made last, um, last week that, that persuaded us of the merit of publishing all FI releases um, on, our, on our website and I think that is the correct thing to do. Um, I, I will take on board the point that Andy Whiteman made about the timeliness of that, and I think that's something we can specifically, sorry, that's something we can specifically look at. Um, Stuart Stevenson, as always, um, put a very historic um, angle on uh, in today's de debate, a historic context, and, and I thought that was that, that was helpful to remind us that it wasn't all that long ago this legislation came into effect, and, and there are still people in this Parliament who were very much part of that. I acknowledge. The, the role that um, Mr Wallace had in, in bringing that legislation forward. Um, it may have been a challenging thing. I know that Tony Blair, um, after bringing forward similar legislation in the UK, um, said that it was his biggest regret was to introduce the freedom of information legislation uh, information um, in, in the UK. But um, I hope, um, to conclude, I hope colleagues realise that this government really does have a serious take FOI and open government seriously. Our culture is one of openness across Scotland. Our open data strategy sets out our high-level guiding principles to su support making data I'm open. Um, and we will continue to look as to how we can improve our performance and improve the access to information um, going forward. Thank you very much. President Officer. I call Graham Simpson to close this debate. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a good debate, but one that we brought with a collective heavy heart. That it was felt necessary to bring this motion to Parliament is testament 
to the way this government treats its citizens with disdain and derision. Last week, there was a members' debate on this su subject with no contribution from the SNP, save from a rambling and embarrassing performance by the Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick. Claire Adamson was clearly watching something else. And I can tell Claire Adamson that there was palpable anger after that performance, and that is what led to this debate today. Now, I want to pick up... Uh, no, I want to pick up uh, something that Mr Fitzpatrick said right at the start of this debate, and it's quite concerning. Um, he seemed to be suggesting that the very fact that we have an information commissioner means, in his words, that there is an ongoing independent inquiry. Now, that is not what this motion is calling for, certainly. Joe just Fitzpatrick. To be, just to be, to be clear, what I said was the Information Commissioner's actions were an independent inquiry. The Information Commissioner is independent and the Information Commissioner is um, taking action um, after having looked at our performance and that is an ongoing process. Graeme Simpson. Her actions are not an independent inquiry. What this motion calls for is something entirely different. Right. It is separate from the Information Commissioner. That's what Parliament will be voting on. Now, it is encouraging that the Scottish Government have accepted the need for that review and for post-legislative scrutiny, but they've been dragged kicking and screaming to that point. The background to this debate is, of course, the open letter signed by 23 journalists expressing grave concerns about the way FOI has been handled by this Government. That was mentioned by Neil Finlay, Alex Rowley and Jamie Green. And as Edward Mountain said in his opening speech, they complained of information requests being repeatedly delayed beyond the 20-day deadline, emails asking for updates being ignored, delays leading to appeals to the Scottish Information Commissioner, requests being blocked for tenuous reasons and being screened for political damage. Uh, and we had it confirmed just earlier that special advisers are involved in that process. They called for a review, and in our demand for an inquiry, so do we, as well as post-legislative scrutiny, a transparency double lock. Against this background, it may surprise Parliament to learn that the Scottish Government believes it is a beacon of transparency, and that we have in Scotland something called an Open Government National Action Plan. The problem we have here is that giving evasive answers is in this Government's DNA. Now, I ask colleagues for examples. Brian Whittle has given some today, as has Jamie Green. But here's a stonker from Liam Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what the budgeted ongoing costs were for Edinburgh Gateway Station and what the actual ongoing maintenance costs have been. Mr Kerr got an enlightening reply from Humza Yousaf. The operational and maintenance costs for individual stations on the ScotRail network is commercially sensitive information. One of our researchers asked under FOI for information about work done on Scotland and Brexit. There were four lengthy questions. If Mr Stevenson can stop chuntering, I'll get on with my speech. Essentially asking for details of meetings and correspondence on the potential implications of the UK leaving the EU on Scotland's long-run economic performance? The answer, we don't have those records. That has been the modus operandi of this government when dealing with questions. The way freedom of information is treated by this government amounts to censorship worthy of a totalitarian state. But I suppose, why would a government be open with its people when it thinks it is the people? Maybe recent democratic events will help dissuade them of that delusory state of mind. When the FOI Act became law, we might have thought we in Scotland were being advanced. Not so. Scotland is a comparatively recent convert to FOI, with the world's first freedom of information law happening in Sweden in 1766. The Scottish Public Information Forum, which was meant to enable the long-term effectiveness of freedom of information and the Environmental Information Scotland regulations, didn't meet for over six years from 2010 until being reconvened by the Campaign for Freedom of Information Scotland. It will next meet on the 28th of September. 
International Right to Know Day. I'm not sure if the Scottish Government is celebrating that day. Now, we on these benches welcome the Scottish Government's new commitment to publishing all information released under Freedom of Information. The test will still be how quickly answers are given and whether the cloak of secrecy surrounds them. The SNP Government has only responded to 38% of FOI requests with a full release of the information requested. They need to do better. Finally, I'd like to remind the Chamber of the words of the then Deputy First Minister, Jim Wallace, mentioned by Pauline McNeill, during the 2002 debate on the Freedom of Information Bill. He said, information is the currency of an open democratic society. Mr Wallace was right in 2002. We now need a government which holds to his words. That concludes the debate on freedom of information requests. Before we move on to the next item of business, uh, can I remind members that uh, they should always be polite, uh, even when they revert to name-calling? Thank you very much. And uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes for members to move their positions.